My name's Andrew White. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at Milano. Um, and Milano is Graduate School of Management and Urban Policy at the new school. And uh, the center is an institute within the school that's dedicated to advancing innovative public policies that strengthen neighborhoods, support families, and reduce urban poverty. And we run a number of applied policy research projects out of the center with our staff and our students, including Child Welfare Watch, which we publish jointly with the Center for an Urban Future. And Andy Breslau on the back there is our co-publisher. And the project is made possible thanks to grants from the Ira W. DeCamp Foundation, the Child Welfare Fund, the Cyrus Fund, the Viola W. Bernard Foundation, and this event and all our other events is supported also by the Milano Foundation. So I want to say a few words about how this morning's going to work and then set up context. Um, first off, everybody needs to turn off cell phones. <laughs> and um, also up here on the panel, obviously any Blackberries or anything are going to interfere with the microphones. So turn them off if you can. Um, in just a few minutes, we're going to hear short remarks from each of the three commissioners who've graciously joined us on this panel. And I've asked each of them to speak for no more than eight minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll see how that goes. And if time permits, our other panelists, in between each of their talks, our other panelists are going to throw a question or two at each of them for clarification purposes primarily. And then after that, we're going to have a discussion that I'll moderate. And eventually, I'll bring as many of you into that discussion as I can. Um, our goal today is to understand the visions for change in juvenile justice that are emerging at this extraordinary moment in New York and to learn whatever we can about how those visions might be translated into action from vision to reality. I'm not sure any of us in this room can remember a time when juvenile justice was receiving as much attention as it is right now. Today, we have a classic case of an open policy window, a moment when the eyes of the public and political leaders have been drawn to an issue, to this issue, amid widespread demands for change. That policy window didn't open of its own accord. Last summer, the Federal Department of Justice threatened federal intervention after an investigation found poor conditions in four upstate juvenile correction facilities. Investigators found that staff members regularly used excessive force to restrain children, resulting in broken teeth, broken bones, and concussions. And at these same facilities, investigators also found that mental health care was inadequate. For example, children were giving, given powerful psychotropic medications without proper monitoring to see if the drugs were effective or if they were causing side effects. Last October, we published a, a report here at the center which showed that this lack of adequate mental health care pervades the OCFS system. Half the children housed in New York State's juvenile correctional facilities suffer from mental illness, yet there's not one psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse on the staff of the State Office of Children and Family Services, which runs the facilities. The New York Times put this on its front page yesterday, um, five months, I guess, after we reported it, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our research was followed by a comprehensive report produced by the Governor's Task Force on Transforming Juvenile Justice, which was chaired by Jeremy Travis, one of our guests today, and facilitated by the Vera Institute. Another was published by the Citizens Committee for Children, and the Times followed with a remarkable editorial not very long ago calling for radical changes in how this system serves children and families in our city and state. The news media would be reasonable to assume that all of this critical attention was not entirely welcomed by government officials. I mean, it can't be easy to be in charge of an agency, to be a commissioner, when you're getting hammered in the press. But there's an interesting twist to that story. Commissioner Gladys Carrion came into office saying from the very, very start that she thought OCFS's juvenile justice system was broken and that it was hurting black and brown children from the city and locking up far too many children who'd been arrested on misdemeanors. She's fought with upstate legislators to close facilities and reduce the number of children sent into the system upstate. 
And now that the DOJ investigation has stirred even more attention, she's tried to use that to drive further closures. Meanwhile, in the city, the mayor's office and the Administration for Children's Services have ramped up the juvenile justice initiative over the last few years. It's an intensive alternative to placement program that works with families and keeps kids out of state facilities. Nearly 300 children took part in JJI last year. And the city's probation department has been aggressively diverting arrested children from the city's pretrial detention system and away from family court entirely through its own risk assessment initiative. Yet in most ways, the system as we knew it in years past is still the system we have today. Last year, the NYPD arrested more than 12,500 people aged 15 and younger. About half were diverted before they landed in court. But there are only a limited number of formal alternative to detention programs in New York City. And as we will hear firsthand today from one of our panelists, who's a former detainee, children who have no family ready to come get them at the precinct are more than likely headed for Spofford or the Bridges Detention Center. Last month, Mayor Bloomberg merged the city's Department of Juvenile Justice into the Administration for Children's Services. So this puts Spofford squarely under the authority of John Mattingly, who's been managing the city's child protection and foster care systems for nearly six years. The mayor's move appears to acknowledge that this system is about family and child supports rather than corrections. And it reflects the fact that historically, at least half the boys and girls in the juvenile justice system come from families that have also been involved with the child protective system or preventive services or foster care services. Over the course of each year, nearly 6,000 children are admitted to DJJ for detention. They stay there an average of almost one month. Some stay very short, some stay longer. ACS now oversees a pretrial juvenile detention system that on an average day last year had 279 children in secure detention and another 150 in non-secure group homes. Last year of those children who family court judges deemed to be juvenile delinquents, about 550 were sent to nonprofit residential treatment centers, including the one by, run by Jerry, Jeremy Kohamban at Children's Village in Dobbs Ferry, who's also on our panel. Another 460 children from the city were sent by judges into OCFS correctional facilities. Today, there are a total of 534 New York City children in OCFS secure and non-secure facilities. So that's the lay of the land. While reformers and public officials are hoping to create a system that will send far fewer children into detention in upstate correctional placements, the current fiscal and political mess in Albany means we can't really be sure what's possible. Who will pay for alternative supervised programs that strengthen families and work with young people in their communities? <clears throat> and it just so happens we've opened this policy window at exactly the moment when the economic engine is idling in the driveway and the you know, tax revenues are going down the drain. Um, and the political leadership of the state is running around in the front yard acting a bit crazy. Um, so it's a tough time. The Administration for Children's Services already has its hands full trying to achieve permanency for thousands of teenagers in its care. What can it take from that work, without diverting itself from that work, what can it take from that work to improve the way teens are handled in the juvenile justice system? At this point, it's far too early to know exactly what Commissioners Mattingly and Giraldi will propose to the mayor in terms of concrete policy changes and what they will seek from the state and from city budget officials in terms of concrete investments. Commissioner Shiraldi's only been in office now for about 12 days, okay, <laughs> nine days. <laughs> Nonetheless, I hope we'll get some inkling about all of that today. So I'm gonna quickly introduce the panelists and then we're gonna hear from our three commissioners Right to my left is Melkita Cardrona Lowe, who's a youth organizer with Safe Passages for Youth, which is a program, a project of the Correctional Association. And she's gonna tell you about her experience in the juvenile justice and foster care systems. Commissioner Gladys Carrion has been with the uh, Spitzer and Patterson administrations since January 2007, running the Office of Children and Family Services. 
She was on the board of Child Welfare Watch um, prior to going up to state government and was executive director of Inwood House. Next to her is Commissioner John Mattingly, who's been at ACS now since 2004 and has um, come to us way back when now, it seems, from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Vincent Schiraldi is Commissioner of New York City Department of Probation and comes directly from Washington, D.C., where he was Director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services and has been a New Yorker, a San Franciscan, and I guess other cities as well. It's good to have you here. Jeremy Travis is President of John Jay College of Criminal Justice and has been there also since 2004. And he was at the Urban Institute in Washington and was director of the National Institute of Justice under the Clinton administration. And last but certainly not least at the end of the table is Jeremy Cohamban, president and CEO of Children's Village in Dobbs Ferry and also a member of the Child Welfare Watch Advisory Board. So Gladys, can you keep it to eight minutes? <laughs> I can do it in four. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, and it's great to see everybody. And so many of you have been my partners in trying to make change that I think you could probably give the speech and uh, probably do a better job. So I'm very hopeful today, maybe because my budget hearing is over <laughs> and uh, I survived another year. Uh, but I have to say, looking not only just at the panel, but the work that we've accomplished, that I really do think um, that the stars are aligned. You know, the theme is, um, you know, the emerging visions and how can we all work together. And I got to think, I got to say that I really do feel that a consensus has emerged that we have to transform our juvenile justice system. You know, that it's not a question mark anymore. Um, that we firmly establish that it's a broken system and that we have to uh, reform uh, and transform it. I think that when I started on this job, it was something that was, I thought, rather self-evident. But as I emerged and in trying to talk to all the different constituencies, I realized that it wasn't. But I have to say that I really do feel, and certainly by this turnout, that we've reached that consensus. And I do feel that there is a political will for change now. Um, that I don't think was there uh, before. And that with the support of the governor and the legislature, and now the New York City mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, I really do think that that political war will is there. State and city agencies and local counties, there is life beyond New York City. Uh, I have discovered, you know, I'm a New York City girl, and uh, I've discovered the cows of state. Um, but the, uh, all the state and relevant agencies and the city agencies are working in partnership. We are all working in partnership in New York City uh, with probation, before with Marty and now with Vinny, Children's Services, John, and, deter and detention now being merged with um, ACS. I think that there is a real alignment of vision and priorities. And I have to share that I really do feel that the judicial branch, which is so important, is a partner. And I think they've signed on. So I really think that we have all the necessary players in terms of government. The good government organizations, the advocates, the media, and I got to say the advocates have always been there. The media and public leaders have all joined to support transformation. And that's why I think the stars are aligned. You know, I think all of the right players are really aligned and sh have a shared vision. And I think there is leadership at the state and local level to drive and implement change. And we have a little bit of help from the Department of Justice. And I think you probably all have heard <laughs> that Legal Aid now has joined the fray and has sued me. Uh, and they have filed a class action lawsuit challenging conditions in 14 facilities. And so, while there are some constraints now on what I can say because of all the litigation that we're involved in, there's still a lot that I can say. So with all of that support, I think, 
um, what is really <coughs> helping to drive change, <coughs> excuse me, is that now we have a blueprint that helps us catalyze all of that energy and sense of urgency that we have. And it's a blueprint for change. And that, that as a result of the governor's task force for the transformation of juvenile justice, which President Jeremy Travis, and we have one of the co-chairs, Judge Corriero here, you know, was issued in December, which gives us, and I'm sure that Jeremy will speak about that, so it gives us a really um, good, good blueprint for how we need to move forward. And I have to um, acknowledge the work of Vera in helping us um, put that together. So we have the leadership, we have alignment, and we have a plan. Um, so that's why I think that we have that shared vision that's emerged, that recognizes that for too long we have been incarcerating too many children who pose a little threat to public safety and with dismal outcomes at great cost, not only to the public coffers, but the lives of those children and families. And we, all, we need to remember that. We agree, and there are a lot of things that we agree, and that's why I want to focus on being positive. Um, we agree that, I think everyone agrees now, that these children, with a very small exception, that these children have the capacity to heal, to change their behavior, to succeed, and that we acknowledge that they are assets that we need to nurture. I think that there is that consensus. We agree that placement should be limited to those children who truly are dangerous and pose a risk to public safety. I think we all can agree on that. We recognize that children and families do better in community programs with services and supports and that diversion must be our first intervention. We recognize that there must be a continuum of community and placement options. We agree that children, if they must be placed, must remain close to home and families and communities must be an integral part of the process of developing and implementing a treatment plan. We recognize, and I really do believe this, even in, uh, in the questions that I got at, at my budget hearing, I think there was that really fundamental recognition of these principles. We recognize that we must provide children in the juvenile justice system with a quality education, with career awareness and training, and with the appropriate services and supports they need to address the trauma that they've experienced. Their mental health and substance abuse issues have to be dealt with and addressed in an environment free of violence. I think we all can agree with that. We also know that we must begin the planning for re-entry into their communities and reintegration into their families the day they're placed with OCFS. And we have to move them as soon as possible to community-based services. So the question is, how can we work together? And how can we really seize this opportunity? I think that it is still vitally important to continue to advocate for change in the entire system, from police practices and interaction with youth through release. While I think that we have a shared now vision, I think we continue to need help to make sure that we can move to implementation. We need to advocate for more investments and invest what we have more effectively. We need to continue to work together to develop and create programs grounded in best practices, evidence-based, evidence-informed approaches. Many times, I mean, we do know what works. We need to do what works. We need more services at the community level. We need to build capacity in the communities where these children and families live. <coughs> Those are the things that we all need together. Well, I have, I think, taken a leadership role and appear in the New York Times every day now. <laughs> this is a shared responsibility. I think folks up there share it. I think many, many of you share that responsibility. So I continue to need your help in order to move toward implementation. So I'm going to stop there because I promised I was going to be brief and uh, open to entertaining all questions except those that I cannot respond to because of pending litigation. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gladys. Before we move on to John Mattingly, I wanted to ask um, Melkita and Jeremy and Jeremy if they have any sort of quick questions for Gladys to sort of dig a little deeper into what she just spoke about. Either of you? Any of you? No? Jeremy. I do. I don't know if it's... Uh, no. Why don't you go ahead, sir? Jeremy? Yes. Jeremy? Thank you, sir. Jeremy. Go ahead, please. <laughs> that, that would be me? Yes, um, Commissioner, <coughs> you, you spoke about the need for a therapeutic culture and so on. And, uh, and Andrew said that about 50% of our children in the detention systems have mental health issues. But, but I think that number varies. I've heard numbers as low as 30%. But even if it's 50%. It's more like 65%. Okay. Okay. If it's more like 65%, that still leaves about 40% uh, or maybe a little more, a little less of young people who are not mentally ill, who are there simply because they made a dumb teenage mistake. And yet, once they come into our system, the residential system, especially here in New York, they are very quickly described in clinical terms, labeled clinically. Those, that clinical language then interferes with the discharge and the support we ne need to give our kids and families in getting them back home. Are you willing to take a public stand about that play uh, that constantly gets in the way? This notion that somehow that every kid that comes into the residential system is a sick kid. I've said that already, so you're a little late. Oh. <laughs> I don't, you know, I think that we do pathologize too many of our young people, and, uh, and I agree with you. Um, and I, I will submit to you that even if young people do have mental health issues, I think they still need, can be in the community. They don't need to be in placement. Once again, the standard needs, are they dangerous? Do they pose a risk to public safety? I think one of the biggest challenges that I have in implementing the transformation is really not to fall into creating a medical model. You know, as I move to do uh, my behavioral, you know, health uh, uh, treatment plan, and we've brought in national experts to help us do that, that I want to make sure that that is built within the framework and grounded in youth development principles, and that we work to normalize behavior of young people. And I, you know, I, I understand that uh, deeply, and that is my biggest worry um, as the kind of resources that I have and, and, you know, the focus. I think DOJ has been... Um, while difficult, difficult, because no, you know, as hard as we work to try to improve the system, um, and I think we have done some improvements, a lot more needs to happen, uh, it is very painful to read that report, and so very painful for me. And, um, and that becomes a lever, um, you know, as they focus on the mental health, that we now want to respond to that, and all our focus is in creating those mental health supports. That needs to be balanced, and I understand that. Jeremy Travis. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and it is wonderful to look out and see this standing room only. So congratulations to the new school for collecting this crowd. Um, Gladys, a political question. So you talked about um, a remarkable moment in time, a consensus. Um, um, Andrew talked about this uh, sort of window of opportunity, and that is all true. There's this alignment of the stars. Uh, and you talked about the support you've had from your governor and uh, from now from the mayor. Uh, you talked about the um, alignment with the judiciary advocacy groups. Uh, you've passed over a little too lightly, uh, so we've come back to it, the legislature. So we have a rather dysfunctional legislature at the moment, uh, and they are the ones who have to make not just you know, pass budgets every year, but in order for the transformation to occur, they have to, they have to realign budgets. They have to redirect resources. They have to think creatively about uh, how best to support uh, community-based uh, uh, interventions as part of the downsizing uh, that our task force recommended. And there's a number of uh, difficult statutory uh, reforms that they have to enact. So could you just expand upon the extent to which they are part of the uh, one of the stars that's aligned? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, having had my budget hearing on Tuesday and being before the legislature, um, I will tell you that we have some great partners in the legislature with both Senator Montgomery, who chairs the Committee for Children and Families in the Senate, 
and Chairman Scarborough, who chairs the Committee for Children and Families in the Assembly. Um, and we've worked in, in, um, closely with them over the course of the three and a half years that we, you know, I've been at OCFS. And they have been tremendously um, supportive, and they've already submitted some of the legislation that we need. Um, so I think that they're, you know, we work very closely to help inform them, to help and work with their staff. Will it be difficult? I think it is difficult because of the fiscal climate and the constraints that the state is facing. <clears throat> that we continue to experience some pushback from upstate legislators that, you know, that's honest. But, you know, they're in the minority. They are in the minority. Um, they have, interesting enough, there was only one legislator that came to the hearing. You know, last year, you know, there was a full court press, you know, when I had my hearing to uh, attack me for closing facilities. Um, but so every year, you know, we kind of break down that resistance more and we get more partners in the legislature. They're tremendously concerned about the fate of the children. And, and the majority of, the, of these young people are from New York City, so I've really um, worked really hard with the New York delegation to, you know, really make them understand what our challenges are. You know, last year they put additional money in the budget. We'll see how this budget plays out. Um, I try very hard to keep them focused on the work that needs to be done. So I, I am hopeful, I really am hopeful that um, the threat, quite frankly, of taking the system into receivership looms large, and I think that they don't want that to happen. Um, so I, I think that's that, that external pressure, as difficult it is, might be at times, is helping to push the legislature to do the right thing. Great. Um, Commissioner Mattingly, I'd like to take the podium or speak from there? I'll speak from here if okay. I can. Everybody hear me in the back? Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see such a large crowd. Um, I'm going to start off by telling a little story. Um, you, that big gulp you just heard was our communications director, Sharman Stein, <laughs> um, and Andrew, I think. Um, but last night I had one of those moments in um, my long, long, perhaps too long career that just need to be shared. Uh, I got this fabulous letter from a 17-year-old Adopt, now adopted child who uh, had grown up um, since age two in a foster and then adoptive home. One of those, she has, she's the youngest, has seven brothers and sisters, all adopted. Uh, and the brothers, all, all her big brothers were there last night in ties and shirts uh, to see their um, uh, little sister perform. She's a, uh, a dancer now. Um, the letter was so compelling, I felt like I just had to see um, this young lady. But what was most impressive about it is she performed, then she brought out a troop of young men and women uh, from a nearby family shelter, whom she has been training several days a week for months now to uh, become interpretive dancers themselves. And they were big and tall, short and round, boys and girls, um, that you'll see on the streets of Brooklyn any day. And they were fabulous. And what was most impressive about it is here is, this a, young, here is a young lady who has already started to give back. And it just made me feel so good about the work that we all do. Uh, that those of you who are in the system right now or have been in, um, you too are playing it forward so we can move forward and the kids who follow us will do better. Uh, those of you who work in this system, those of you who help to lead public and private agencies serving young people and their families, um, we don't see enough of this ourselves or it doesn't touch us enough in person. But the work that uh, this young lady is doing and the life she is living is just so impressive, it, uh, it makes me feel like what we've been doing is uh, really worthwhile. So, that wasn't too long, Charmin, right? So, all right. Um, just a few points. one of these as you were talking? <laughs> just a few points, um, and then we can talk uh, as you'd like to. First, I think it, it's most important to remember that the mayor 
um, made bringing disconnected youth uh, into connection with their communities, their families, uh, their neighborhood institutions, um, the highlight, I think, of his speech this year, State of the City. Uh, of course, many of the media treated uh, the speech as if, and this speaks volumes about the work we try to do and how important it is, as if he had nothing big new to say, right? Because he was talking about disconnected youth. Um, so he did have something really big to say, uh, and we are only at the beginning of where we will be going because of his leadership, uh, but we are moving in different directions. Uh, it is true that the Administration for Children's Services, I call Children's Services, uh, is in the process of beginning to join with uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice here in the city. Uh, it is true that we have recently selected an executive deputy commissioner for uh, what we are going to call, I think, the Division of Youth and Family Justice, Larry Bushing, who's sitting right up here in the front. Yeah. And we are right now um, knee deep, um, shoulder deep in an effort to begin the process of bringing the resources together of these two organizations that have the very similar goals but have had a very different career trajectory. Um, there are many reasons why this decision may have surprised people, but there, as you think about it, there are many reasons, I think, why it is the right direction to go in. First of all, we are primarily uh, dealing with the same young people uh, and their families in these two systems. A large percentage of young people get caught up either on probation, in the juvenile uh, detention system, in OCFS's school, uh, training schools. A large percentage of them have had some contact uh, with ACS. Many of them have been in foster care themselves. Now, let me rush to say what I think um, probably most of you already know. <clears throat> it's not as if ACS is uh, done with all the work we've been up to in the last uh, four or five years. It's not as if, well, ACS is fixed, so now we can work with another agency. <laughs> well, uh, you, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen anywhere. And DJJ is not something that needs to be fixed. What we are doing is bringing a $2.8 billion agency with 6,000 staff, that's ACS. Uh, we're bringing th those resources to bear on an agency of about 134 million uh, with less than 900 staff. Uh, we are integrating our work. We should have some savings in that, but primarily we want to bring the experience that we have been having in the past five years especially um, through our JJI initiative, bring that experience that young people and their families uh, can do better and don't need to be driven deeper into our system in order to get them the, quote, help that they need. That's the fundamental and primary purpose of our work, of our joining our work. Secondly, um, there will be, and this is, these are just my words right now, not uh, what we're going to actually end up with, but there will be only a few key principles that drive the work of this uh, effort in behalf of youngsters caught up in the justice system. Uh, first, of course, uh, we have to take very seriously our responsibility to protect the communities that we serve. That has to be first and foremost. It's not as if, and I think we all know it, but we focus so much on the needs of young people and their families. It's not as if they haven't hurt somebody or stolen something or gotten into trouble repeatedly, one time after the other. To ignore that is to uh, just sort of hope that they'll do better. And we don't want to do that. We want to help. And we want to help people be responsible, young people, for their own behavior. So that's sort of a primary principle. But secondly, these young people belong somewhere. They belong to their family. 
not to the system. They belong to their communities, their neighborhoods, their faith communities, and they belong to this city. And so as part of our community, they belong to us and we are responsible so that they and their family can do better. In most of the cases, their family will do better if we can help them help their young people. Sometimes we have to seek, especially in ACS, alternatives uh, to some families. But most families love their kids deeply and don't want them to get tr in trouble and sure don't want them to have to be locked up in any sort of setting. Uh, thirdly, no young person caught up in our system is going to come out of that system hurt. We do not hurt children. That's a primary principle, and we have to keep that in mind throughout our organization. I hate to have to say it, but that's what has to be said. We don't hurt children. Um, and finally, each one of these young people who comes into contact with our piece of the juvenile justice system will leave us feeling just a little bit better about himself and about his potential future. Those are the principles that will guide us. Now, I know uh, we have a long way to go in this new joint effort, not just in ACS, but now with ACS and DJJ coming together. We have a long way to go to make those principles real. But it is our intention to do exactly that and to begin to do that in the very near future. So watch and listen. And for God's sake, help us, because we're going to need all the help that we can get to move forward. Um, I say this a lot about child welfare. It's the same thing in all public service. Um, and I want to be clear about it here now. There simply is no quick fix in this work. There's only the hard work we have to do. Uh, it's true that many of us have had a sense of how to do it and what to do. But it can't just be done overnight. We have to work at it. And we intend to do that. But there also is no silver bullet. You know, if you just put in alternatives to detention or you don't, quote, lock some, somebody up, things will be fine. Well, that's not the way it works either. There is no silver bullet. There's only the work to be done. Uh, thirdly, there. Um, is no free lunch. Uh, you can't do this work without spending, expending resources uh, on the effort. And uh, as Vinny, I think, will talk about a bit more in a minute, we uh, need the state's resources in order to bring these young people back and to keep them out of the system. It is great to be closing down things, but we also have to open up things. And to do that, we're going to need the legislature to step forward and give us the resources that they, in fact, will be saving because of Gladys's great leadership. So there is no free lunch. Um, I ask for your <coughs> support, but we'll have to earn that with many of you as we go forward week by week. Uh, I also personally ask for your prayers, uh, but I tell you that we will uh, look in four years very differently, differently than we do now, and we will have results in terms of families and children that look a lot better than we have been able to do in the past system. Finally, the work that has been done in this city for the past eight years uh, in behalf of these young people has been quite dramatic. It, in the midst of higher arrest rates, we have uh, lower incarceration rates, we have fewer kids in care for briefer periods of time, and we have fewer kids rearrested than we used to have. Because we've started to look carefully at the high risk young people, the medium risk young people, and the low risk, we are detaining far fewer of the low and middle risk kids. And we are detaining more of the high risk kids. So the work that's been done is, doesn't need to be undone. We just need to put our resources together to build further. 
So stick with us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any um, one question from each of the non-commissioners in the front of the room? Nokita? No. Okay. Jeremy Travis. Um, <coughs> this is very exciting, uh, John, and uh, congratulations to you and to the mayor for for this um, really very important step forward. Um, I think, and uh, it presents some opportunities that. Uh, um, were discussed within uh, the deliberations of our of our task force, uh, and I wonder if you would comment on them as well. Uh, we it was not within our mandate from the governor to look beyond uh, the issues of, of uh, the placement facilities and the decisions on how to how young people got there, uh, but a number of members of our task force, myself included, were very concerned about the entire system, sort of how the not just the, sort of this back end or uh, the detention decisions were made, but uh, starting at the point of uh, police uh, interaction, police arrest practices, and particularly concerned about uh, the uh, the extent to which those decisions appeared to have some sort of racial racially disparate uh, outcomes. So here you are now with the mayor, the supportive of uh, of this uh, of this overall direction that we're talking about this morning, uh, and uh, most of the kids who end up upstate come from New York City. Uh, and you alluded in your remarks to the, the um, good result that uh, we have fewer kids in, in, uh, in detention but more arrests. So I wonder if, if you think of, uh, of a larger brief here for, for this merger to look at the, at the system, how judges, how prosecutors, how police, uh, these other agencies at the local level interact with your system uh, that you're, you're establishing with DJJ and particularly about the issues of, uh, of racial disparity. Sure. Thank you. Um, critically important set of issues. First, um, we intend, we as a city have already been doing this, but we intend to redouble our efforts to work closely with the NYPD and with our courts, um, with our prosecutors uh, and with our advocates and supporters uh, and legal advocates for the young people and their families. We can't do this uh, unless we do it together. We can put um, wonderful, smart, new policies in place. We can actually sometimes get uh, our own staff uh, to uh, follow those policies. Not always, but sometimes. Um, but without everyone who is part of this system dealing and taking part in it and arguing with us about what they think we're doing wrong, and letting us argue with them about how we might do it better, we won't really go forward. We'll feel better about we're on the right side of issues, but we won't go forward. Having said that, I think that the national shame of the disproportional impact of our systems, juvenile justice, child welfare particularly, on communities of color is just that. It's a crime. None of our systems can just change something like a policy or train people differently and all of a sudden that will all be better. This will only be better when all of the folks who are involved in our system work together focused on exactly that. And we've seen now, I think with uh, our experience at um, the Casey Foundation, I worked next door to Bart Lubau who uh, started the Juvenile Detentions Alternatives Initiative all around the country We've seen now that in that case, in the terms of detention, we can drive down the disproportional impact quite remarkably. It's more complicated and difficult, but just as necessary in child welfare. But we can have an impact on that, and we must. Uh, we can't change our neighborhoods and communities, our schools, by ourselves, but we can together. Finally, our approach in, in children's services has been, and we will bring this to bear, I think, uh, in the, the new division. Uh, our approach has been that if you bring community leaders and plain old community members into the room to help you make decisions, even with particular families and children, you will have less disproportional impact. If you bring parent advocates to help you help parents deal with their children, you'll have less disparate impact. 
if you make the families themselves central to, our fut to the future of these young people and to the decisions that we make, you will have less disparate impact. Um, and that's our commitment as we move forward from here. Jeremy Kohaman. Commissioner, I can uh, see the merger really working in the area of the Juvenile Justice Initiative because we've had a number of years of practice and we've kind of worked out the kinks as we've gone along and that probably could expand quickly. But the, in the DJJ system, one of the front ends is truly this non-secure detention aspect. And in New York, um, <clears throat> we, many of our centers are, uh, end up in some of the most poorest and least powerful neighborhoods and some of them end up looking like mini jails. Uh, what's your thinking about the non-secure detention center? And my, the reason for asking that is because in a jurisdiction outside New York City where we provide non-secure yeah. detention, uh -huh. yeah. a full one-third of our kids that come into non-secure detention actually stay at home with in-home supervision. And one of the architects of that program is right here. I'm looking at him right now. Um, Robert, you. <laughs> uh, 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 intensive supervision. Uh, they do well. We take them before the judge and we have a story to tell. Not only that he was home and going to school or she was home and going to school, but the things that we achieved while the child was in the community and safe. Uh, are you willing to consider some changes to non-secure detention? Um, having been a community, a community organizer for years, Jeremy really change that question right at the end so it would be so easy to answer. Well, yes, I'll be happy to consider it. <laughs> why, well, you're new to the department. To, I mean, we used to demand yes or no in the neighborhood. So, um, yeah, I think that it's very important that we not get locked into certain kinds of models. Um, as some of you know from experience with me, um, Group settings in general are not things that I'm terribly happy with if, uh, in our work. And group settings are important and they're, they have a place in our work and they certainly have a place in detention. But we have to open up a whole range of other options as to how we control or attempt to control or at least monitor the behavior of these young people until they go to trial. And there are proven ways to do that that don't involve residential care, but that do involve families, and they do involve uh, frontline staff, some of whom are part-time, who track young people so that we know they're going to school or not, yep. so that we know they're going out the back door of the school first thing after they leave us or not. It's that kind of thing that will help turn behavior around without necessarily all of the trappings of residential programming. Okay, uh, Commissioner Shiraldi. Yeah, is it okay if I just, can sure. people hear me if I just stay here? Yeah. Put the mic closer, okay. So my problem with the whole eight minute thing is that I only know six or seven minutes worth of stuff, so I'm gonna vamp for like a minute. Um, uh, thank you guys at the new school and, and Andrew for doing this. And I, I actually took classes here 25 years ago when I was working out of the offices of the Fortune Society, which at the time was up on 19th and between 5th and 6th. So there's been a lot of old home week moments for me this last nine days, and today is day nine, um, <laughs> including the fact that I live now on the same block as my high school. Uh, it's really weird, because I keep having these recurring dreams about papers that I haven't finished yet, you know? Uh, so I'm going to talk about three things today. One is the experience I had in D.C., just, uh, just finished having in D.C. One is some trends nationally that I think uh, people <coughs> ought to hear about that, that relate to what, what we're going through now. And the other is two very specific things I think we ought to do. Uh, so I'll start with D.C. first. I was the 20th director of my department in the 19-year uh, history of the lawsuit that I inherited when I started. So I'm sure at the beginning of those 19 years, people thought this lawsuit was really going to bring us home, it was going to fix the problems of the system. Uh, but 19 years and 20 directors later, I can tell you, it takes a hell of a lot more than a lawsuit to get you where you need to go. And I know you're not saying that's all you need, because I know you're closing facilities and taking action. Uh, but when 
I stepped into that particular stream 19 years later, it was as decrepit and foul as it was at the beginning. In fact, in some respects, even more decrepit and fouler. Uh, girls weren't getting feminine products when they had their periods. Rats and cockroaches were crawling on the kids at night. I think there was an active sex for overtime trade. Uh, they the staff were bringing drugs into the facility. It was kids were testing positive more frequently after a month in Oak Hill, which was our main awful correctional facility, than they had been on the way in. So let's hold on to that for a moment, right? Mm -hmm. So it was easier to score in my facility than on the streets of the District of Columbia, right? Uh, every single one of the kids, we talked about disproportionate minority confinement. I was director for five years. I never had a white kid committed to my care during a five-year period I was there. And now I'm in a de uh, department where 95% of the kids we recommend to Gladys's care are African-American and Latino. Um, that's the bad story. The good story is it's a hell of a lot better now than it was when I got there. And I would encourage folks to try to get a tour of the facility. It is a very nice, secure facility. And for any people who know me, the words very nice and secure facility rarely <laughs> occupy the same sentence in my lexicon. Um, it's about as nice and uh, a physical plant, program space, school as you'll find. My staff are trying to learn how to become like the folks in Missouri are. Some of them are fighting that every step of the way. Some of them, of them have embraced it. And then there's a bunch of folks in the middle, you know, licking their fingers and stick it in the air, trying to figure out which way the wind's going to blow. Um, and so I won't, I won't say that that part of it is where I'd hoped it would be five years down the road. And I'm telling you, we had those Missouri folks in my facility 35 days a month. We, we, we paid for 35 consultant days a month. They were there constantly training and coaching my staff. We weren't just like, it wasn't just a weekend trainer and then go, go do the Missouri model, right? Uh, and folks, I'm, I'm assuming people know what the Missouri model is. Uh, Jeremy and Vera wrote about it in, the, in their report. I don't want to say a lot about it. If folks don't know, you can ask me questions later. But it's about the healthiest and most decent secure care you'll ever see any place in the country. Um, and so we tried to get the folks at, in, in D.C. to embrace that. They've embraced it somewhat. It's certainly much better than it was before, but it's still got a ways to go. Um, and, and I'll just sort of stop there and get on to my second part, which is that's because these places inherently stink. And we shouldn't think this is unique to New York, right, in the years 2006 through 2010. If you look back on the history of most juvenile correctional facilities, you'll see they're characterized by sort of scandals, public attention, cries for change, commissions get established, people lose interest, they entropy gradually, and there's another scandal and call for attention. And that's, that's just the way it is with these places, right? For a number of reasons. One is any time we take someone's liberty away, we got to watch it, right? We got to be careful. We got to guard ourselves, and we don't want to. It's a pain in the ass to guard ourselves. Nobody wants scrutiny, right? One. Two, total institutions, places into and out of which the public cannot easily flow, they, they have a cer certain, set of cer certain set of characteristics, right? Irving Goffman taught us that in the asylums. It hasn't really changed since 1960s when he wrote that, right? And that's true for all sorts of total institutions, be it the military. His, his book, he talked about nunneries, that's what they called them, um, <laughs> you know, psych facilities and, and correctional facilities, right? It's like, for folks who haven't been locked up or haven't worked in them, it's like the day a year you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? <laughs> Their job isn't to piss you off, right? That's not why they were hired. And, and they probably were nice people coming in, but there's just <laughs> only so much humanity people can deal with before they... Um, dehumanize, right? It's why the, your number is more important than your name, right? And, and, and that's true f for these correctional facilities, but it's more true because they're full of poor black and brown kids hundreds and hundreds of miles away from anyone with power that's getting ready to take their back. Whereas you, at least, you got a fighting chance. Hell, you're a judge, right? I mean, you're going to DMV. You, got, you are a judge, right? You got some juice there. What do these kids have in, in, uh, in Ithaca and the Adirondacks, right? They got, they got you taking their back, but that's pretty much it, right? And you ain't there all the time. So that's what these institutions do. There's plenty of research to show that bad outcomes flow freely 
out of these places, right? One study in Arkansas showed that future criminality is best predicted holding all other things constant by institutionalization. Far better than gang membership or coming from a broken home, right? Many times better, right? So this, you know, John talked about public safety, which we have to hold forth most. Absolutely. These places for the wrong kids are, insti are factories for crime. They're places where we go send kids to make them worse for $210,000 a year. So forget all the research and forget all that stuff I just said. What I just want you to take away from this part of what I'm saying is if you had $210,000 in your briefcases and your kid was in trouble, would you get in your car, shackle him hand and foot, no, we don't do that anymore, right? And then drive him up to Tryon and hand it to the superintendent and say, here's $210,000. I can't think of any better way to protect the public and turn my kid's life around than by giving you this $210,000. The best I can do. So here you go. And if it wouldn't do that for your own kid, why are we doing it for the thousands of kids that we serve? So then... The good news, again, I, I want to sort of try to give good news every once in a while, is that, um, <laughs> is that a lot of states are picking up on this, including New York State, as John mentioned. So if you look in this millennium, and this is different than prisons, so a lot of us, are, a lot of folks here are prison people and, and juvenile people. You've got to realize there's a little bit of a difference going on now. The prison population is still growing nationally every year, kind of like a weed in the yard. It's not, really, it's not really growing because people are actively saying, let's lock more people up, right? That was sort of the 90s. Now it's just kind of growing because nobody's gotten around to doing anything about it. But that's not what's happening in juvenile facilities. So in this decade, there's been a 27% decline nationally in the number of kids locked up, right? And um, that's two-thirds of all states have had a decline in the number of kids in their incarcerated population. So New York is not alone in this. California went from having 10,000 kids in what used to be called the California Youth Authority to having 1,500 kids there. Texas's prison population dropped in half, right? Texas, right? Louisiana. <laughs> Louisiana dropped like 60%. Alabama, Tim Roach, my friend there, has been working in Alabama. It's been a 40% decline in their institutionalized population in Alabama. This is a national trend. It's not, we're not on our own. And it's because I think people are, I think the research has gotten better. I think the steam has gone out of the, the war on crime. And people can now, there's, it's costing money, but it always costs money. It costs money before, too. Um, but I think, uh, I think some of the work that advocates have done, some of the work that researchers have done, some of the work that policy wonks have done, and the waning of this sort of frenetic war on crime have allowed people to do the right thing. And that's what's happening, I think, in New York. And I, and I think New York City, as John mentioned, has really led in that regard. Now, there's been some, some downside to, to, to New York City leading in this regard because we're taking it in the shorts from a money standpoint. And, and people need, this is a little the nuts and bolts, not philosophical moment in, in what I have to say, right? So I got a chart here, right? I'm not sure if I'm allowed to show this, but I specifically didn't ask if it was okay so that nobody could tell me I couldn't do it, right? Um, and what this chart shows is back in FY99, New York had, New York City sent at 561 1,944, let's call that 562,000, uh, total care days, that's what we call them on the yeah, center. Care days. Care days. Total care, care days mm -hmm. that we paid for for kids in OCFS. And those 562,000 care days cost us $54 million, right? So now, uh, what's projected for this year is a substantial 53% reduction in total care days down to 235,000 Total care days. Yay! Everybody say clap for that, right? That's good, and that's John and Marty, not me. I'm going to get the credit for it, but that's these guys that did that, right? Um, but we're spending $64 million for those half care days, okay? So 562 down to 235,000 total care days, 54 million up to 64 million. And that doesn't even include the 11 million bucks we spend on JJI and the three or four million bucks we spend on Esperanza, right? If you go back to 05, which is when Esperanza started, right? And then, and then uh, the year after Esperanza started and then JJI came on in 07. You go back to 05, we went from 330,000 care days to 235,000 care days. We went from $33 million to $63 million, $64 million. So we, we, we nearly, we doubled, 
uh, even though the numbers of care days went down. And the OMB people are saying, because we're going to John and I are saying, hey, let us fund more alternatives. It'll save money. We'll spend less money sending kids to OCFS, right? And they're saying, well, <laughs> look at the chart. We're spending eleven more million dollars, not counting the, the money you spent on your thing, even though you cut it in half. Why is that? Because we haven't captured the money from the state yet. And this leads me to my final two points. We need to capture the money from the state, right? <laughs> so Jeremy talked about this in his realignment uh, statement or question earlier on. It's in the report. They talk about reclaim Ohio and redeploy Illinois. They used the two cutesy named ones, but there's a good dozen states that have realigned. California got from 10,000 to, to 1,500, massively realigning state services. They basically said, you cannot send us any more nonviolent offenders, and we'll pay you for that. But they said, you can't send us any more nonviolent offenders. Texas said, no more misdemeanors. It's illegal to send a misdemeanor to the Texas Youth Commission. New York needs to figure out how it's going to do this. All right, we, we, we got to stop talking about it. We got as good, we got as good a commissioner as we're ever going to get, right? We ain't going to get any better than Gladys. But now we got to seal the deal on the state realignment or we're just not going to be able to do it. The OMB people are not going to let John and me keep asking for more money so that we can take kids out of a system that's charging us more for the fewer kids we send them. Ain't going to happen, right? That's the real deal. And so this year, right, we need to do at least a partial realignment of state money. And at Vilmanette Montgomery's got one bill. We got a bunch of people working on, do we like that bill? Do we want a different bill? I can't tell you whether, where we're going to come out on that, but the Bloomberg administration is on it, on this. As, as John mentioned, you know, the mayor came out of the box at the State of the City address. We're now doing our little bureaucrat committee work on it, right? So that's this year. We need to come up with something that advocates and the administration and the state can all live with that helps change this because there's just only so long the city's going to be altruistic, and I'm sure this is true for the other counties as well, right? One. And then two, eventually I think we need to totally realign state services to the city. I think we need to do what Marty Horn said when he talked about Project Zero. We need to stop sending kids upstate. We need to do what they did in Wayne County, Michigan, which is Detroit. Wayne County used to send 800 kids in 1998 to their state system, to their equivalent of OCFS, they sent 35 kids last year. They basically took the resources, brought them home, set up community-driven lead entities in five sections of the city. They divided the city in five. The community came up with what they want to do with the kids in those areas for the community-based stuff. They set up a couple of large locked facilities, which are nothing particularly to brag about. We ain't going to replicate that part, right? We'll do it the way Missouri did it, 20, 30, 40 bed. Uh, nice, as nice as you get, rehabilitative facilities. But that's what we should be doing. So short term, I think we need to get a realignment bill that we can all live with that gives some money, that grants some money to localities that are sending fewer kids uh, to OCFS so that we can prime the pump and start uh, uh, creating, well, I shouldn't say start because New York has already started, continue creating the kinds of alternatives that will keep the public safe and help turn the young kids' lives around and then I would argue the full tilt boogie a year from now, we take the whole thing back. Great. That's it. Am I right in assuming that that $63 million doesn't even include the cost of the 550 kids in residential treatment placements? I meant to ask that question before I came, and I didn't. So mm -hmm. I don't think it does, but right. I'm not sure. Okay. Any OMB people here that could answer that question? <laughs> Um, Jeremy Travis, do you have any questions for Commissioner Schiraldi? Welcome home, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> great to have you here. You know, I wish we had someone who cared about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, it really is great. You know, Vinny and I have traveled in the same circles for a long time. It's great to have you and your uh, passion and your uh, particularly national experience uh, here in New York because that's precisely what we need. We, we are very parochial. New Yorkers, and uh, we don't uh, tend to look outside our own boundaries. And uh, Vinny uh, referenced, uh, as did our report, that, that, that there's incredible stuff happening in other states around the country, and uh, and we need to figure out how to become a leader again. Um, and uh, you know, New York used to be the sort of progressive voice, and we have not been that for decades. And it's really um, time for us to uh, to reverse that. So. Uh, is I, is I, sort of the bottom line I take from your comment is you want us to secede from the state. 
right? <laughs> so you, you want to, you know, Norman Mailer tried this a long time ago, and uh, uh, it's not not a bad idea. Uh, but I wonder what what advice you would you would give to all of us as we're thinking about the the uh, I'm harping on the sort of legislative agenda. Ask Gladys the question, uh, asking you the same question, which is, uh, in order to do what has to be done, the legislature, famously at the moment at least uh, dysfunctional, needs to take on some very tough political issues. Mm -hmm. It needs to uh, to take on unions. It needs to take on upstate uh, representatives of uh, jurisdictions <coughs> where uh, the facilities that we want to significantly downsized or located. Uh, it needs to uh, to be able to realize the savings that you want to have redirected here. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to take on some, some tough issues. So uh, knowing the New York situation as you do and but knowing the national situation as you do, what's the lesson from some of those other national uh, experiments in other states right. about how you develop bipartisan and whatever their version of, of upstate, downstate is, uh, statewide support for a multi-year agenda that's going to redistribute money and power uh, uh, at a time when uh, you know, people are still concerned about crime. Now, uh, uh, just excellent question. Couple couple thoughts. Is Eddie Borges, are you here? By Eddie's any chance? here. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Great. Eddie sent me a bunch of newspaper clippings uh, about you know it was actually one of the best briefing pieces I've seen because it just sort of took me through what was you know, what was happening from the standpoint of what politicians see, because they ain't never going to see this, right? Most of them are never going to read They, they this didn't all read it? No, they didn't read that. But they'll read <laughs> so the editorial in the old Albany, you know, yeah. uh, paper. And so um, I saw that there was this sort of nice clustering of editorials about the folly of running empty facilities in between January and March of 08, which I thought was perfect, obviously, for the, for the legislative session and the, and the budget session. Um, so one thing we need is we need another one of those, right? We need, we need that again uh, because some politicians is going to be this bipartisan consensus, blah, 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 right? But whoever's the senator from where Tryon is, they just can't give it up without a fight. And it's foolish for us to think we're going to achieve consensus with some, some folk. And so somebody, and I think there's come some advocates here in the room, somebody's got to pick a fight, right? And that's... Somebody's got to do that, right? You guys got to pick a fight. Go pick a fight. Us bureaucrats have a harder time doing that than you advocates do. Go pick a fight. I, I would urge you to do that in case you misunderstood the first two go pick a fights I said. <laughs> um, and then I, think, I, then I do think we need to get together, right, advocacy community, state, city, and we need to come to consensus around, and, and you guys have done a tremendous amount already, uh, but around a real deal. What bills can we really honestly support for each other so that while you guys are out there, you know, stirring it up, we can work with the various associations and the people that are going to, you know, walk, stalk the halls of Albany to, and, and they can say, well, how does Gladys feel about that bill? Oh, Gladys isn't supportive. Oh, so how does John Manning look at it? How does the mayor feel? And, and the answer is always, how do the advocates feel? It's always, yep, everybody's on. We're on board. We're on board. So that the opponents are isolated, right? Because they are a dog with a bone. Right? If you're a senator from where one of these places are, that's your priority right now. And if you're at a union, that's your priority, right? Because eventually they know that people got to lose jobs. They, they got to lose jobs. There's no way to do it. Otherwise, you can't save the money if it's attached to a body. So, yeah, we can do all we can. And I know that, that, that you've done this, Gladys, uh, to try to get people retrained and put into different agencies. But at some point, people might actually lose jobs. So those folks, they're clear. They know what they're going to do. Now, we got to get equally clear, and whatever we're saying, it's got to be the same thing. We have our talking points now. That's my team. Right. Points. Jeremy Kohaman. Welcome home, Vinny. Thanks. <laughs> stay, stay long, because <laughs> this stuff is going to take time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, Commissioner, I, I mean, who could argue with the things you say? Uh, and your passion. Yeah, people do. I, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not one of them, I promise you. But I do want to ask you a couple questions. The first is, I love the idea. I mean, I, I went to college in Kansas. I know a lot about the Missouri model, spent time there. Um, I love it. I, I cannot see us opening a 30-bed facility within New York City limits. We can't even open a recycling uh, station without going to court 16 times, honestly. Uh, I, I can't see it happening. I, I want it. Uh, hey, look, I've spent 20 years of my life doing this work because I believe in it, but I can't see that happening. And the realignment battle with the state, 
is going to be much more complex than we want to do. So what, what's your vision for the short term? How can we hit the ground running knowing that a 30 bed facility, unless, I don't know, is there a destitute neighborhood in New York where we can like force it down their throats? Maybe, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, maybe. I, I just don't see it. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I, won't let it, I won't want to let it lie there. I think that um, particularly if you contract out a lot of this stuff, um, there's a lot of folks in communities that have the juice to get stuff to happen that us bureaucracies never can get to happen. And you just, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, they had the same issue in Missouri. I mean, they, they planted these places right in the middle of people's neighborhoods. They, did it, they, they had a whole unit whose job it was just to site facilities, they had tremendous relationships with the communities in which they, that they went into, they did the hard work, they did zip code hiring, so destitute communities would know that A, kids are coming back to our community that used to be here, and B, that's gonna mean jobs for people in our community, and our people can do those jobs in this community. You don't have to have a PhD to work in one of these facilities. So um, I, I won't give that completely up, although I do recognize it's gonna be a huge lift, and I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialize it either. Um, and that's why I want to sort of get started because four years seems like a lot of time, but four years ain't a lot of time, yeah, no, right? Not at all. Especially what I'm just proposing, four years just about does it, right? We're going to gasp across the finish line if we start today, yes. four years from today. Um, there was another well, what, part what, what can we do right oh, now? Oh, in the meantime, yeah. Well, I, I think, I honestly do think, you know, uh, Senator Montgomery's bill existed last year. It's always good to get in, I think, on the second year of a bill because big bills like this don't usually pass the first year. It takes a little. So I, I, I think that there's a shot there that if we, if we can agree to it, we can get the state to agree to it, and the advocates can agree to it, I think that there's a chance to get some um, realignment bill passed this year. Other than that, bureaucrats can do a ton of stuff without legislation, but we got to figure out this money thing, because if we can't, it's really difficult for us to make the sale from our side that please fund programs uh, because they'll save us money. And so I don't know that that takes legislation. It may take conversations that just haven't happened yet to figure out some way to capture some of those funds. Um, but I'm not smart enough on the budget stuff yet to know the answer to that. Hey, I gotta it's tell only you, day nine. We, Tomorrow we, we, we never answer. called John and Gladys bureaucrats before you got here. Yeah. So I, all, I, I meant us, is, too. Uh, I meant me, too. This is a change here. Don't worry. We'll train them. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I want to shift the discussion a little bit to, to sort of ground level, and then we'll come back to the, the bigger policy questions. But I want to talk a little bit with Melkita Cardrona about her experience being arrested at age 13 in school um, and what happened. So you grab a microphone there and, and start us off a little bit about your experience, I mean, the point here is to get into sort of what could have happened differently that didn't, but Malkita. Um, I went to Frederick Douglass Academy, too, on 114th Street and 7th Avenue inside of Watley High, and me and a co-correspondent decided to do graffiti in the school bathroom, and she decided to put her government name first and last and got caught, and of course, opened her mouth and said I was involved. So we decided, well, they decided to speak to us and involve the police, and we got arrested and got sent to the 28th Precinct. So while at the 28th Precinct, they did the procedure, contacted our guardians, and they told my aunt that um, if she didn't believe I would go to court or make it to court, that the best place was to send me to Spofford, also known as Bridges. Well, that's when my aunt decided. <laughs> Bridges was not for me, though. I was 13. I did graffiti. I didn't feel that it was a need to be shackled, sent to jail, like, at 13. So when I got there, went through the procedure, strip search, stuff I've never seen before. I was at home, never had. I've been arrested, just never went to a prison or juvenile justice detention center, I should say. Went through procedure. I was there for a couple of days into my court date, and going to court, I got changed over into my regular clothes that I came in in, and was shackled, arms, feet, and waist to the next person sitting next to me. I'm 13, I'm looking like, how am I supposed to be shackled all the way down, and I'm a female in a school uniform. So I'm in skirt, tights, 
shoes, and I really felt uncomfortable. Like, and being that I'm all light skinned with my skin condition, it was like I had the marks even after court. Like, after I'd been unshackled for a couple of hours now, I still have marks because of the way they have the chains. And because we had to get in paddy wagons instead of the, um, well, because we had to get in vans instead of the cars, it's a higher up step. So it's like to hop into a van while you're shackled all the way down is extra hard. So I was sitting there like, my court case ended up me having a year's probation, e enhanced supervision. Like, I did graffiti. I didn't stab nobody. I didn't fight. I didn't assault a teacher. Nothing. I straight did graffiti. Like, I'm from Manhattan, Harlem. I grew up doing, like, seeing graffiti done. I lived in a project, so <laughs> who don't do graffiti? <laughs> you understand? Like, none of y'all can't never tell me I ain't do graffiti. Now I do it to others, like, paper, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That time it was the bathroom, like. <laughs> so to me, it's like I look at it, and I s that experience was just awkward because you go, you get locked up, you see girls in there that's in there for really fighting and stabbing girls, and I was like, I fight and stuff. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but this time I didn't even do nothing that bad. Like when I was doing serious stuff, I didn't get sent, but I got sent for graffiti. So it was just. Awkward, and to see inside when I first got there, it was like, wow! I got to get strip search, hands running through my hair. I got to take everything off, squat and cough. I thought that was a joke at first before I actually got locked up. The squat and cough thing, I really thought it was a joke. <laughs> and I looked at the lady like, "You really want me to squat and cough? Like, what is this? Like, I didn't understand." And she was like, "No, this is procedure." Then we go upstairs. They gave me a cookie, a pack of cookies and the milk, and send me to bed. Like, I've been in the precinct all day. They fed me before I um, left. And then all I get for dinner before I go to sleep is cookies and milk. <laughs> then I get up to cold sausages, then brown and serves. Y'all yeah, know about those. <laughs> and they was cold. They were still frozen. Eggs, not even cooked all the way. Like, and then you send me to court. <laughs> like, I didn't understand it. So what happened on probation? Probation, my probation officer was in, well, first I had a probation officer in Manhattan because I was from Harlem. And then I came in the foster care system and I moved to the Bronx, so they transferred my case to the Bronx. And honestly, I didn't have a problem on probation. I got drug tested once, so, you know, I didn't have a problem. My probation officer, I think, you know, had a thing for me, honestly, because she really didn't care about my case. She really, I saw her maybe 12 to... 13 times out the whole year, if that much. Like, I didn't really have to go to probation. I always made up an excuse, or I got school or something. Mm -hmm. She ain't argue with me, so I didn't have a problem with probation. It was more the experience in Sparford that really altered everything I thought. Like, it was just... I guess the key was you were telling me how after Sparford, things changed a lot for you. I mean, your, your, your yeah. aunt died, who my you had grown up with. My aunt died, my case was in April of 06, and my aunt died in September of 06. So by the time my case fully got processed and all that, I got on probation June of 06. So it was like by the time everything got processed, my aunt passed, I ended up in foster care. And I really, by the time I had really got back into the school system that September when I came home, it was like I didn't want to go back to school. You understand, they enrolled me back in school for the September. I actually didn't go. That was I was in ninth grade when I got arrested that April. I was in ninth grade that September. Never got out of ninth grade. I obtained my GED recently, but never went back to school because it was like, if I could get arrested for graffiti, we all know what happens in school. We all fight. You understand? Kids, it's going to be kids. You understand? We're going to fight. We're going to argue. You understand? It depends on the situation, your surroundings of what really happens in school. So for me to get arrested on graffiti charges, I'm looking at it like I can't even go back to school. You understand? Like my peers didn't see me go out in handcuffs. You understand? They all talk to me like, oh, Mel, y'all really got arrested. The other girl went back to school. You understand? But for me, that's not something I want to do. I don't want to show my face in school no more. I don't even want to be bothered with the teachers because now they got a different perception of me. They want to think of me differently and look at me like, you know, 
I really wasn't really going to class. You understand? I was always smart, but I wasn't really applying myself in a way because school was boring. Honestly, yeah. so can, it can, was can like. Can I invite you to so John Jay? We'd, we'd, yeah. we'd, we'd love to right. have. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, so you had, you also um, talked about ending up being in hospital and in, and then placed ultimately at Hawthorne Cedar Knowles RTC. Yeah, um, because I went to the hospital right before my aunt died because situations at home with my father, he had came back into my life or whatever. And my aunt was my adoptive mother, so I wasn't with my parents all my life. So when my father came back into my life, I'm 14, you want to sit here and play the father role, but you ain't, you haven't been there. So it's, to me, it's like you can't beat me. I can respect you enough to listen to you, but you can't beat me and stuff. So it was like a strain on me, you know. And then my aunt was getting older, so he felt he really supposedly had to step in. And I didn't look at him as my father, so... It was a strain on me, and I became, like, pretty much suicidal and stuff. That's why I went to the hospital. So it was like, for me, I went to the hospital. Then they wanted to put me in foster care for a little while until my father moved out, and my aunt ended up dying while I was in the hospital, so I got stuck in care. So it was like, then I really ain't want to do nothing. Like, I just ain't want to go to school, didn't want to go home school, like, nothing. It was just like, what's the point? So... Um, my agency, before my probation officer could put in the request for me to go to RTC under OCFS, my agency put in a request for me to go under ACS. And I went to Hawthorne Cedar Nose and up in Hawthorne, New York. And I was there for a year and a half, from July 17th, 07, to um, December 22nd of 08. So I actually preferred to be there. Like, if they would have sent me there as an alternative to going to jail. Um, I probably would have been home before my aunt died. You know, I probably would have been there when she died. So I felt like that would have been a better alternative because I actually learned the therapeutic way to deal with stuff. Like stuff that the average kid thinks that they are just dealing with. Right. They think that they're dealing with. they actually just throwing in the closet. And I learned how to actually deal with it. So it was helpful to me to go up there even though I didn't want to be in the boondocks, being I'm a city person. <laughs> but it you know. took about two years before you got that kind of counseling, right? That kind of help. Yeah, because um, I got arrested in 06, and I didn't go up there till about the middle of 07. Okay. But so no. And then when I went up there, I wasn't too big on being up there, being it was in the woods. But when I actually settled down, I, yeah. Right. And then finally, coming back from there, you... you been in a uh, residential program with Green Chimneys down here in the city yes. and made a connection with real help at last. Yes. Right? Um, coming to Green Chimneys, my first placement in Green Chimneys wasn't all so well, but the second placement, um, I had a primary counselor who's now my adoptive mom. She's become my adoptive mom. So, um, yeah, made some real connections and officially live with her and stuff. So it, it's beneficial, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with the staff at the OBH on the Green Chimneys, which is um, something board at home. <laughs> yes. So it's agency of uh, board at home. Therapeutic so board at home. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Risa can tell you um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I made connections, and they worked hard for me to do what I had to do, which led to me obtaining my GED, filling out my college applications, and getting my internship with Safe Passages and stuff like that. So now I'm on the right track, so to say. Yeah. So we can't give the kind of time we should to delving into this, unfortunately. But I'd, if you can just say a couple of things that you wish had been done differently in your case and how it might have changed your life. I honestly don't believe that I should have been sent to Spofford. I honestly believe, personally, which is why I'm also advocating for Spofford to be shut down, that it should because it's it's not an environment that kids should be placed in. It's not even an environment I feel adults should be placed in because I've been inside the adult system, too. And this place looks different than Spofford. You understand? It, it's better... It's better design, I should say, than Spofford. Spofford actually put a, a shell on top of me that I wasn't able to remove right away. Like, 
when I went into the system and I came in with this attitude, like, you understand? You're probably already going to lock me up, so why why even, you understand, try with y'all? That's the attitude I had. So it's like, I feel that if they would have sent me to a program like where I was at the Dome, when I visited the Dome, the alternative-based program, I think I would have been better helped and my family could have better helped me get back on the right track and actually finish high school instead of obtaining a GED or, you know, get counseling services. Thanks. That's great. And, you know, I, I know you haven't done this before. It's, I very much appreciate you your being so open. Um, I guess this brings us down to some of the policy questions, or up to some of the policy questions. And I, um, first and foremost, can Spofford be shut down? People have been pushing for this for years. What will it take? What uh, would yes, it take? Yes, it can. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, it can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Better than the other answer, right? <laughs> so something has come up in the discussion so far in a few different ways, which is really about these sort of supported living programs that could be alternatives to secure. And then there's some discussion about non-secure. One of the things that Gladys said, if they must be placed, they must be placed close to home and supported by families and communities. And reintegration with families must begin the day young people are placed with OCFS. I think people who work in the detention system would like to see reintegration be fundamental even when children are in detention. And remember, we're talking about children here. These are children 15 and younger. Um, could the commissioners speak to this um, question what what technical steps have to happen? Is this can nothing be done until we get some kind of reinvestment from the state legislature, or are there contracts that can be let in the near future that could begin to shift some of this system over to nonprofit organizations, for example? Well, let me start. Um, with help, uh, especially from the foundation community, we can get started right away. And OMB has uh, expressed an interest in supporting our efforts anyway uh, in the first uh, beginning next fiscal year uh, to develop and implement alternatives. We've already got models out there, some of which are operating already, uh, like JJI. Um, and there's no inherent reason why we cannot, within the next year, change the face of uh, how we do all of the work at DJJ. Uh, there's no inherent reason why we cannot make um, those facilities more secure but also more family friendly. Uh, there's no reason in the world why we can't take a look at what alternatives there are to all of our detentions. Uh, and there's no reason why we can't revisit our uh, decision-making process about who goes into detention and which kind of detention they go into especially when we develop and put in place uh, uh, efforts like tracking systems or young people working for us who keep track of these young people. So um, you will see uh, in the city uh, some major beginnings uh, very soon. Um, I don't want to say what they will be until we finish taking a careful look at what we have already. It's, uh, I think, foolish to... Um, simply say what we have had doesn't work because it has worked, but it's also important that we take a fresh look as, as outsiders. Mm -hmm. right, let me sort of add something to that. Um, you know, on detention, I think we need to think way, way broader than what contracts can we let and what programs can we do. Um, if you look at what Casey Foundation did through JDAI and also what Vera did in New York, there are a lot of a lot of bases you got to touch if you're going to right size your detention population, and it's a mistake to start with programs. It really is, because very often kids are just sitting around in these places. I went to a Catholic high school on the Upper East Side. Trust me, nobody went to Spofford for graffiti in a bathroom, 
or smoking dope in the bathroom or getting in fights in the hallways, which we did, right? So, so there's risk. I mean, when like if you look at some of the model JDAI sites, Portland, Oregon, Chicago, Santa Cruz, they're sort of fixated on every day counts, right? You, the, and one of the things, I, I did an analysis for Casey on their uh, disproportionate minority confinement. And one of the most profound things somebody said to me is that disproportionality, disproportionality flourishes in a sloppy system. Systems where kids just sit around, where nobody screens them for risk. When they get in there, the, po the case gets postponed. I'm telling you, man, there ain't no white kids from the Upper East Side just sitting around Spofford today for graffiti that are going to have their cases postponed. It's just not going to happen, mm -hmm. right? And so before you put that kid in a program, mm -hmm. which then if they violate, they might really get in mm -hmm. trouble because then they, they're going to anger the judge because they didn't listen to the judge, right? Mm -hmm. Some of those kids just, just hurry up. Get the case done. Or screen them out. Don't let them in in the first place. And some of them need to go to programs for sure. They need help and all that kind of stuff for sure. But some of them just need to go home and come to court the next day and have the whole damn thing go away. Should they be arrested? I, I don't think you should. Well, I don't know exactly what you did. I, I trust your representation on the graffiti thing. But that's all you did now. No. Bad time, right? <laughs> uh, no, you're not. Not at all. <laughs> Jeremy Travis, what role does the NYPD oh, play in all of this? Yeah. <laughs> I know you've been a long time since you worked in the NYPD, but there is this um, question of, you know, there's a lot, the police have a presence in the schools now that they didn't have years ago, well, and that is clearly a feeder into this. I mean, there was there was. Uh, one of the reasons for my question of uh, Commissioner Mattingly was to, is to the importance of looking at the interconnectedness of these decision-making uh, uh, agencies. And at the front end of the system is the police department. And Can you, you pull know, the I, mic close? Yeah. Thanks. And I, I think uh, we have to be very concerned as New Yorkers, uh, as people who care about, about young people, about the very high level of arrest for very minor offenses <laughs> and uh, keeping young people in custody that was not the policy uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, a big part of that, maybe not numerically, but I think uh, sort of um, symbolically and uh, sort of conceptually, is the role of the police in the schools. Uh, and uh, there are unfortunately many stories that could be told by uh, young people, like the one uh, that we just heard about people, but children being arrested in schools and their cases being processed as if they were, you know, very serious criminal offenses uh, that would not have happened before. And it, and it, it what, what, what that does is to sort of move the, the, the problem down the assembly line so that we then start saying, you know, where, does this kid go to Spofford or not? Does this kid go into a program or not? Where the real question should be the one that you asked was, should this young person have been charged with a crime and should that, that misconduct have been treated that way? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a profound conversation that we need to have about the, the, uh, the over-criminalization of, uh, of, uh, of behavior. Right. What are the politics within the Bloomberg administration to address that kind of a question? I mean, there, there is a culture within leadership that makes decisions to put cops in schools and arrest kids for these things. Can anybody, uh, any well, of the three I'll of you speak Well, I'll just say, uh, as uh, one of the representatives of the administration here, that uh, things are um, in flux and that there uh, will be an effort on our part at the city uh, to pull together the stakeholders and take a fresh look at uh, how uh, young people enter our system and where it is that we need to intervene more effectively, uh, either in terms of um, everything from security to sending more kids home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've already visited the three secure facilities and um, especially at Spofford at the intake point, it's not clear yet to me um, why we can't exercise some of our uh, responsibility, our decision-making authority early on. Um, and I think we're gonna take a very careful look at that uh, uh, pretty quickly. Gladys, is that something you would like to see 
change at the city level? Is that anything you can comment on? Well, I could comment on it because it's not my system. <laughs> 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 no, I actually do think that um, as one of the recommendations from the task force is we need to start looking very, you know, earlier um, at the system. And I think it's really important in starting to look at police practice. So I welcome the opportunity to work with the city collaboratively to look at that. Too many of the young people that come into our system start just like, you know, we heard that it's been an interaction in school where kind of normal adolescent behavior becomes criminalized. And I think when we went to school, Vinny, which was a very long time ago, <laughs> um, those things didn't happen that way. You went to the principal's office, they called your mother, you know? They made you write 1,000 times, I will not talk in class, as I remember. So, you know, and, and not to trivialize some of this behavior, but, um, you know, we've had very young, we had a 13-year-old in Tryon that was there uh, because they defaced, graffitied on a tombstone. And Tryon, as you know, is probably one of, you know, the most troubled facility that I have. This young man was 12 years old. And he was there because he violated probation. The terms, one of the terms for probation was that he go to school. Well, he wasn't going to school before. And it was doubtful he was going to go to school without some effective intervention. So he ends up in a place like Tryon. I happened to be there that day. And you're right, I can't be in my facilities every day. And we pulled him out. And we put him in a in a voluntary agency, and this young person and his family is doing very well, but he could very much have been on track to become a career criminal, because that's what we produce. Um, you know, earlier you had asked what are the, some of the things that we can do, and I'll tell you that one of the things that we're looking to do in the state is really look at all the facilities that we have in New York City, and really uh, looking at reusing them, kind of retooling them, so that we convert them from um, revocation programs or um, and uh, very limited use that we have, reception centers, to really become, uh, to bring young people from upstate. And we can do that. We have a, a facility, uh, a group home in Brooklyn that's across the street from Mega Rivers that we can convert uh, and really create a model program like a Missouri. And that's something that we're going to be doing soon. And, and, you know, money is always an issue. And I think we've worked, the three of us have already started to work together to ha start the conversations with the philanthropic community. They're never going to replace government dollars, but those are the seed dollars that we need to get some of these things off the ground when we can invest some state dollars. Um, I have an RFP out right now for $4 million to support programs for alternatives um, uh, to detention. And shortly, we're going to put out uh, another RFP. It was a million dollars for alternatives to placement. Um, so that, um, and I think the other thing we could do is look at, as has been suggested, but um, investing the money that we have more wisely and looking at what flexibility that we have as administrators to move money around. Um, and so we're, we're taking a very close look at that and, and have some plans underway to do that. I was just at Medgar Evers last night, and I know a young lady who will start uh, dance classes across the street whenever you're <laughs> That's ready. Great. So. All right. That's great. Um, I'm going to take questions from the audience in just a second. So if you have a question, please put your hand up, and we have a couple of people with microphones who will come around. So while you're doing that, Tom, um, while they're doing that, I'm going to ask one more important question, which is, well, it's two pieces. It's for Commissioner Carrion. Can you explain the TANF issue? This sounds technical, but if you look at the state budget, they're taking 10 some odd million dollars out of alternatives to detention by eliminating the TANF funding in the, in the state budget for OCFS. Um, and then plus, what are the politics of getting that restored over the next couple months? Not only that, but other funding restored for alternatives. Well, let me start by saying that this is a very difficult year. Um, as we all know, and I think that the governor in presenting his budget was very clear that this not is, it is not a budget of choice, but it is a budget of necessity. What the state has experienced has been an increase in the caseload for temporary uh, assistance, the TANF caseload for public assistance. Uh, the TANF money that last year went to support a variety of programs in my budget, not only alternatives to detention, but after school programs, domestic violence programs, Mandatory, you know, uh, mandatory preventive programs, all of that money that supported those programs have been swept out of my budget to support the increase in the caseload in TANF um, uh, usage. And so that now poses a, 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 a really difficult challenge for us because we just don't have the money. 
Now, as you know, the governor proposes a budget. He recommends a budget to the legislature, and the legislature uh, uh, decides. Um, so this is a process, and we're at the beginning of the process, and I think many of you here are veterans in the advocacy process around the budget. I had my budget hearing last week. There were many advocates there. In fact, there were so many advocates that a second hearing date for Janu uh, February 23rd has been scheduled in Albany because advocates didn't have time to testify about what they thought uh, about the budget. Um, this is very, very painful for the governor. Um, you know, the governor has been committed to these programs. He's been supportive um, um, on the transformation. I would not be able to do any of this and close the facilities that I've done uh, to get the reinvestment and to get the additional dollars. Um, but what my budget does is preserve the core, uh, uh, core mission. And, you know, the OTDA commissioner went after me um, um, after I testified, and I think she's still testifying. So uh, it was she was there for for uh, I think f you know three or four hours, and and then she will be back on the 23rd. So those are very very difficult choices, but it really is due to the increase in the caseload and the TANF money. The primary purpose um, has to be to support uh, public assistance caseload. Mm -hmm. To what degree do you have to spend? the 18 million new dollars that have been put into your budget for facilities, on facilities, as opposed to something else? Let me clarify that, so it just tells you how under-resourced this system is. Um, the 18 million dollars that is in my budget provides for 167 new positions, only of which 13 will be for community reentry workers. The rest will be for four facilities. It is part, it is for the remediation plan for the Department of Justice once they approve it. We continue to be in negotiations with them. We have not reached an agreement yet. But the 18 million is what we anticipate we will need for just four facilities. And by the way, one of those facilities I am proposing to close. And it still will require to $18 million. Um, while we're trying as hard as we can to stretch that money to provide some improvements across the system. This is going to be the first phase, and there is additional dollars in the out years, and there's been a commitment from our Department of Budget and the governor to fund this in a multi-phase uh, process because, as you know, our system continues to be so large that I have, after closing 14 facilities, I still have 26 facilities and 21 campuses. Does anybody else on the panel want to comment on that particular element of this and sort of the, the result, it seems, of the DOJ um, investigation could be deep investment in those four facilities, but then what? No, I, I think this is a point where all of us have to do a gut check on um, on where we, where we want it all to go. I mean, I... I The, the conflict between facility improvements and deinstitutionalization is as old as institutions itself. Um, I was upset to see a front page article in a New York Times about there not being a psychiatrist. Because if anybody who knows anything about running these places thinks that a handful of mental health people thrown into these upstate facilities is somehow going to change the essence of what happens in them, they're out of their minds, all right? So, now, now I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not saying that Gladys isn't working his, her hardest to improve conditions in these facilities, and all of us as decent human beings, we can't let kids suffer while we figure out how to close the places. On the other hand, you can't spend the money twice, so we gotta figure out a way to be able to get the kind of money that we need to create the kinds of alternatives that these troubled young people, and John was right, these are not just you know, misunderstood kids. These kids have some problems that we have to deal with. We can't just tell them, go forth and sin no more and stick them back in Brooklyn and the Bronx and, and hope that nobody and commits please. another crime. We need to help them out and we need money to do that while at the same time Gladys needs to, uh, to, to make sure that they're not coming to harm in those facilities. And that's a really raw issue, I think, because um, it kills me that they're, they're staffing up facilities that she wants to close. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here and my OMB people won't let me create an alternative for 100 kids and we're gonna staff up a facility that's about to close? 
that doesn't make sense, really. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense, and and we all got to get together to figure out a way to figure out which places are going to close, how we're going to recapture the the money, and how we're going to beef up and support Gladys in beefing up the kinds of services that the kids in the remaining facilities are going to get. Um, but we have to do it all sort of simultaneously, or we'll end up dumping a ton of money into facilities. We'll increase how invested those communities are in the industry in their town, and it's going to be an even harder fight to get them closed ultimately. All right. All right. Um, I do want to add one yeah. thing to that. Uh, for uh, everybody in the room who uh, has a legislator, senator, or assembly person um, from the city, I don't want you to assume that your representative is actually uh, on the right side of this issue from our perspective. Uh, the, uh, the power of labor uh, doesn't stop at the city um, boundaries. So that the question, the first question that many progressive legislators will ask Gladys or me or any of us is, so what about uh, the unions up, upstate? So they're not necessarily leading the effort at all. I just want you to know that. So that means we have to work on that. The question over here, and please identify yourself. who have been thrown in, and the kids as well, and my colleagues providing care. My question is this, and also I do work on disparities um, in special education. So now you know where my question is kind of maybe going to. I was driving in, 1010 Winds was reporting on staff that were in a school that were being charged with filming and holding down um, kids while they were fighting. And so my question to the panel is not necessarily that this may be your work to do, but what type of preventative partnerships are being considered and being pushed for, say, in the Department of Education? The teachers who send people for, to prison for graffiti. Anyone? Well, I could, I could tell you what we're trying to do at the state and what we've been working really hard is to get, and I think if any, you know, at least John and I, being candid, will tell you how difficult it is to get the education folks to the table. Um, and I think that's probably uh, all of our experience. In fact, I've had um, more success in New York City with the Department of Education um, in New York City that I've had with my state sister agency. Now I think that that's changing um, because we have a new state commissioner. And so it's a new day and he's brought in a new senior leadership team. Um, they're critical to be at the table. Uh, Department of Education is critical. Uh, we have so um, many issues in common that we need to address, including the truancy issue, educational neglect, all sorts of and the, the work, the educational um, programs in my facilities. So they, they need to be a key, key partner. And I will tell you that um, the legislature, including uh, at the state level, including um, Kathy Nolan, who's the chair of the Education Committee, and Senator Montgomery and, and Senator Scarborough have actually worked with me very closely to get the Department of Education to the table. And we have some legislation that would require them to do certain things on our behalf of our children. You know, what I have found, it's not just the Department of Education. Um, I have found that every system, both uh, mental health, um, OMRDD, substance abuse, in the past really have uh, advocated their responsibilities to their children because my system is a system of last resort. It, it's as if they have no responsibility. And in this, on the state level, we've created a cross systems um, commissioner's cabinet where we talk about these issues. And so now I have mental health, the Office of Mental Health, providing staffing and training in my facilities. I will have uh, substance abuse programs in all of my facilities that will be run by OASIS. Um, so that, but that, you know, that took a lot of collaboration and work. Uh, so the other systems recognize that they have a responsibility to these children, and it doesn't end when they come to me. Just to add to that, that um, 
I've only seen the education programs in two of the three secure facilities, and I was um, very impressed. The uh, schools working in um, um, the two facilities I saw were first rate and were doing great work with the young people. So we can do better at this. Um, and we've seen it's a long, hard struggle because of uh, the issues that the schools are struggling with themselves. But we've seen at ACS that we can work to get better relationships and more information flowing uh, and more feedback with even uh, the Department of Education as big as it is around uh, child welfare issues. So, uh, for example, for the very first time in the last four years, we've been able to share uh, the information that they have on their children, and that's unbelievably important for us. So uh, there's strong leadership, willing leadership. It's a huge system that has tremendous challenges, but we are they're part of this team, and we have to have them with us. Mel, do you have a comment? Okay. Um, well, I feel that based on the school system and the placement system, the facilities and stuff, they get this, being that they're being told that they can call the cops and the cops will respond and the cops feel that they have to respond because dealing personally with the cops and the staff and the teachers and stuff, the staff call because this is what they feel is procedure. This is what they have to do in order not to respond to us and restrain us and stuff like that. And then the cops are personally tired of having to respond to these facilities and having to respond to these schools. They tell us, like, we didn't want to have to come here. When we hear y'all placement over the radio or when we hear y'all school over the radio, we be like, oh, man. Here we go again. You understand? But this is what the staff and the teachers and stuff is being told they have to do in order to help us. So it's like a cash twenty two. Both sides is feeling like they don't want to, but they know they have to. So it's like what y'all instilling that they have to call the cops and what y'all saying that they have to um have the school truancy and stuff response to situations, that's why we're being put in the predicament. We're getting the bat end of the stick because y'all feel the only way to control us is by cops. Right. Jeremy? I want to make a quick comment about education. Um, there are a couple issues. One is that uh, teachers are as responsible for the safety issue as a child care worker or any security guard. I, I think... You know, we are all responsible. I think all the commissioners said that. Uh, there are no, no one gets a pass on that. Uh, two, there's a tremendous injustice right now in the system where kids of color who are taken into the system are often put into special education, and many of them end up with a worthless piece of paper called an IEP diploma, which is a real, real embarrassment. Nobody wants to talk about it, but we, we must. We absolutely must. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. I've had so many kids say, I graduate, and I say, what did you graduate with? And they tell me it's an IEP diploma, and I say, you know what? You can't even go to Iraq and get killed with that. I'm sorry. I mean, that's, that's just terrible. It's, it's the worst. I've, I've never seen a system that does this to kids, and part of the problem is nobody wants to talk about it, uh, and, the, and it keeps happening, and we, we need to. We need to put an end to that. Okay. Anna? Hi. Good morning. My name is Johnny May Gales, and I'm a paralegal at the Children's Aid Society, where we run several programs for children, uh, for youth, children and youth and families. Um, and I'm also a member of the Juvenile Justice Coalition. But I heard uh, nothing about the LGBT population of youth. And I would like to direct the, my question to Commissioner Mattingly and Commissioner Schwalti in terms of services um, for LGBT youth. Your, um, thoughts on that? Well, um, unfortunately, it's far too early for me to comment on what we do have uh, in our new division in that regard, um, and so I won't. Um, however, I think you can look at what we have built in the last four or five years out of ACS, not that we're anywhere near where we need to be, but we, these young people are particularly at risk and they're particularly um, in need of uh, support. Um, 
they are not uh, so dramatically different that we should treat them differently than all the other young people. They're young people, they need families, uh, they need uh, friends, and uh, because they are LGBTQ doesn't mean that they're some kind of different person. Uh, we've tried to hold on to that as well. Uh, you don't put someone in a group home simply because of uh, their choices in this regard or their questioning in this regard. They need families. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have to pay special attention because of the, how great the risk is for them, especially in our facilities. I began the asking of questions about how they are treated uh, during my first tours. Um, so I, I'm not blind to that issue, I'm very worried about it, but I'm not in a position yet to say what I think about what we are doing. Uh, Mel, did you have, did you have your hand no, up? He's okay. Um, so we're coming down to the end here. A couple of things I wanted to say before we take one more question. Um, first of all, I, got, I have to thank uh, Eddie Borges, Sharman Stein, and Al Medina from the various agencies in helping set this up. And uh, my staff, Eddie, mentioned that uh, there's a OCFS Facebook page where they're posting updates in terms of the legislative efforts um, and other efforts at tiny.cc um, slash OCFS Facebook, if you want to keep track on that. Um, you don't. One more um, question over here. Hi. <coughs> my name is Sister Paulette LaMonaco. I did not spend too many years in a nunnery, but I did spend <laughs> <laughs> So um, I have a question about um, that, that might actually lead to some cost savings, and it really has to do with um, the numbers. If there's ever been an analysis of numbers of young people who uh, wind up in the juvenile justice system because of school security issues. And um, I'm just wondering if there has been that analysis done, number one. Number two, I am wondering about the cost of scanning and uh, the, the incredibly, I mean, if you've ever gone to a public school and you see how long it takes for a young person to actually get into the school, yeah. it's no wonder that young people that have had a hard night the night before in their own families or in their communities don't get frustrated and edgy, and I think it just sets off a whole chain of you know unfortunate incidents. I know it has to be balanced with the safety of the community and the other students, but my recommendation would be to look at the cost of that and to try to pull together a group of folks from the different disciplines, including the police, to see if there is another way of ensuring safety within our schools. And I think that we would find that we'd save a tremendous amount of money in that way that mm -hmm. could be better used to provide community interventions for these very uh, challenging and at-risk youth. Thank you. So it um, sounds to me like something for the mayor to deal with. <laughs> um, anybody at the front of the table want to comment? You know, the, as, as John and I have been talking a lot as we sort of both occupied me a completely new role and John a semi-new role, that we need to look at the data on who we have in our, in our world um, uh, Vera and Jeremy's task force, the governor's task force, did a nice job statewide on that. But we got to sink a lot deeper into it to find out who are we really sending to Gladys, and if we didn't send them there, what would we like to do with them? Um, we led with programs before to some degree. I think we need to leave with data now and say, all right, what do we got? Mm -hmm. And what if, if we could do anything we wanted? If we if we won the whole thing and everything got changed the way, exactly the way we would love it to be changed, what would the array of services look like? And I think that looking at what kids, not just what kids come from the schools, but how did the offense behavior differ versus kids that are coming off the streets? Because my bet is once we look, we're gonna see not only our X number coming, but they're coming for a lot lighter weight stuff than a cop would arrest a kid for on the street, right? Um, just a guess, but we really do need to look at the data. Um, and, then, and then I think from that, and conversations with all the key stakeholders, including the community and the judges and the prosecutors. We need to create sound public policy. And I think, as, as many folks have said, we have a unique opportunity to do that and shame on us if we don't right now. Uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, Jeremy, in talking before this started, Jeremy Kohaman made the point that if you don't close the beds, 
sometime they'll get filled because they'll be there. And I have to say, if you look back at what the crime situation was like in New York many years ago, it's kind of amazing now that so many kids are still being arrested compared to what was going on back when the crime uh, in our neighborhoods was so much worse. Um, this is an amazing room full of people and a lot of great leaders, and I can't even begin to give, put all your names out there, but thank you so much for coming and thank the panel very much for stepping up and talking.